Hello and welcome to another podcast from Equus Law Group. My name is Tom White, Senior Partner of Equus Law Group, and I'm joined today by Kate Kim. And we are continuing in our podcasts on the theme of oil and gas law. We uh, are attempting to educate and empower understanding of our listeners. If your rights and opportunities in this area need to be examined by a competent oil and gas attorney, um, please contact us. We'd love to talk to you about that at a consultation. You can contact us at 330-231-1195. And the topic of this episode is the Marketable Title Act. Kate, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Um, So I, I have notes prepared for us to talk about. And my first question is, what is the Marketable Title Act? Um, and so if we're talking about marketable title, I think that's where we need to start, right? Like what is marketable title anyway? Um, how would you describe I would marketable say, title? I would say the Marketable Title Act is actually fairly old and it was designed to make residential property transfers a little bit easier. In other words, how far back do you have to check to see if there's an old mortgage or an old lease or an old easement or something that would encumber the property that you're going to buy. And the legislature basically said, let's look back 40 years and then the deed before that, and that's all you have to check. Anything that's really old, you really don't have to worry about. So you get into concepts like what's the root of title, deed, right. you know, et cetera. But basically it was, it was designed for residential property transfers um, where you're trying to simplify the uh buying and selling of real estate. Right. So if you're the seller of a property, you want to be able to tell your buyer that you have marketable title, right? Like that's how we talk about it a lot. And we have a title company. And so we often are reviewing title searches, which is something that we haven't talked about a lot in these episodes or title work and title searches. Um, When we're talking about the marketable title act, if, if I was going to go buy a house, I would get a 42 year search done. Right. Right to see if the set my seller has good title to this house I'm buying, like you talked about. Um, I want to make sure that what I'm buying is clear, like you said. Um, why 42-year searches? Do you know? Well, I, I think it's because you don't find many more. The key thing is, is there an old mortgage out there? Is there an old lien on the property? I, let's say somebody got a judgment against a prior owner or something like mm-hmm. that those generally don't run for more than 40 years in the industry. So, I mean, if you got more than a 40 year mortgage, I don't know who is writing those. Sure. So that, that is within kind of the real estate industry, how that concept grew up. It's my understanding. And also, um, of course, if you have what the statute defi- defines as marketable title or good title, you can then get title insurance, which is mm-hmm. if you're buying a piece of property, something we highly recommend If you're getting a mortgage in order to finance your purchase, the bank is going to require title insurance in case there's something out there that the title examiner missed or anything like that. Right. So it it is a normal part of real estate financing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Ohio has a marketable title act, which lays out how, how you know if marketable title exists, like if your title is clear, right? And the current version we use is from 1961. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, the language has been around for a while. We've had this kind of s- structure for a while. Um, you mentioned a root of title though. Right. Um, which when we're talking about residential marketable title, that's not quite as difficult, right? Usually. Right. Um, but we're talking about oil and gas. So well, how? why is the Marketable Title Act, what does that have to do, since it grew up with residential property, why does that have anything to do with oil and gas and mineral interests? <laughs> well, that's a major question, right? And their whole, well, you could ask the Ohio Supreme Court right. why, which is really how we know what the answer is, um, that it was, in, it was in December of 2020 that the Ohio Supreme Court said the Marketable Title Act generally applies to mineral interest. And before that, we didn't know, right? Like we had talked about that. Um, and we had a case that they were going to hear about that, but decided one in the meantime. So that's right. West v. Bode. Right. And it was in 2020. Um, B-O-D-E, for those of you who are looking it up on, yeah. the, on the internet. Yep. And that was mineral interest, I think, in Monroe County mm-hmm. was that case. And so in that case, the Supreme Court said that 
the entire Marketable Title Act applies to mineral interest. And this 40-year timeline we're talking about applies to mineral interest. Um, we'll talk more about the Dormant Mineral Act and what that means and how that works, I think, in our next episode, right? right. So they're related, and it's actually inside the Marketable Title Act, the Dormant Mineral Act is. So we'll talk about that. But we do know now it, the Marketable Title Act applies to mineral interest. But and do you what, think it's simple? Well, no, my question is, it, it is a, it's supposed to be a simple procedure. Right. It's used every day in real estate transactions for residential real estate. What are the problems when you start applying it to mineral interest below the ground? That's a broad, that's a huge, there are all kinds of problems, right? Okay. Can you, you give us, yeah. let's, let's talk about a couple. Um, so in the Marketable Title Act, the point, like, like, We've said, I mean, several times already in the last few minutes, right, is to simplify a review of title to know that title is good. Mm-hmm. When we're talking about mineral interest. The title is... Um, and title means who owns it, right? Right. Yeah. So like a chain of deeds mm-hmm. or conveyances somehow, and it makes a chain. Sometimes chains splinter or, I mean, people make severances, and we've talked about severances already right. in here. Um it's those reasons, really, I think, why the Markwell Title Act applied to minerals gets so complicated. Because people in Ohio have kept and severed and splintered mineral interests and mineral rights all sorts of ways for, usually we'll search back to like the mid-1850s, if we are able to, um, because the rights will get splintered so much. And the Markwell Title Act talks about this 40-year window from the root of title. Mm-hmm. There are whole cases where people are arguing about what deed is the root of title, where right. did this interest come from, and when is that deed, when is the 40-year period, what happened during the 40-year period. Um, all of those things make a difference for what the outcome would be in a marketable title analysis on minerals because a lot of stuff has happened in the last 150 or 200 years with minerals in Ohio. Sure, and if I could, something that we, we wrestle with, is when do you start the 40-year look back? From what date? It says, the statute says, from the date that you're making the determination. Right. Well, the Marketable Title Act is designed for residential real estate sales. The date of determination is the date of closing, the date at which the deed is actually signed and and taken in to be recorded, you know, et cetera. That's easy. What's not so easy is what is the date that you start looking back the 40 years then the next uh, next deed, is it the date that you're looking at in your office? Is it a date that you file a complaint with a court? Is it the date that the court is making the decision? That's really not defined, is it? No. And that so that's one factor that makes a difference. And what period are you even looking at? And the whole reason you want to look in this and find where this 40-year period is, is that if... I think about it this way. If nothing's happened in the 40-year period, the statute says anything prior to that is extinguished. So if somebody kept mineral interest before that period, it's as if they never did. And cases in the statute talk about how that can't be revived. You can't bring it back once it's been extinguished. Extinguished so, means dead. Right. Legally done. It is, com- it is gone. Yeah. Like it never happened at all. So it's really important where the 40-year window is for that reason, because if your ancestors kept interest before that, it might be lost. Um, the statute says root of title means that conveyance or other title transaction in the chain of title of a person purporting to create the interest claimed by such person upon which he relies as the basis for marketability of his title. This is really long. Mm-hmm. And which was the most recent to be recorded as of a date 40 years prior to the time when marketability is being determined. So when is marketability being determined? Where is the 40-year period that you even need to look at? Sometimes there are several severances in a chain. So which one, where is the root of title? Um, all of those things get complicated or can get complicated pretty quickly if a chain of title is not just simple and short and clear, which is unusual for minerals. It, it, it is. is because, unf- and, and, and once again, just to let people know why this is such a phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon because of oil and gas. It's a phenomenon because of the coal that underlay Mm -hmm. a lot of 
southeastern Ohio properties. If your property was going to be stripped, you had the right as a seller to say, well, hey, if the coal is ever mined, I want to get the royalties from it. That, that was, the, that was the, the basics there. But then, okay, let's say you've identified what the root of title is. You've gone through the, the mechanics to do that. What's important about a mineral interest that predates that deed? Let's say we're in 2024, we're looking back 40 years, 1984, and you find the deed prior to that is a 1980 deed, okay? Mm -hmm. What's important about what's in that root of title deed and isn't in that root of title deed for our analysis? Sure. So um, there is case law about this and what... What if the interest is mentioned in the root of title deed? Mm-hmm. So that reservation, or is that where it's made? Was that the first time somebody actually severed and kept the mineral interest? Um, all of those things make a difference if they're in the root of title deed and if they show up in the chain after the root of title deed. Okay. So, and there, there are cases about that, like how specific or general can somebody mention in a deed that Tom White kept mineral interest in, 1981. Sure. And it shows up in the chain of title. Does that save it from being extinguished? Um, if somebody asked me like, here's my title work and chain of title, tell me what you think. I mean, it would take a, it would take time to go through it and apply all of those things to see what the courts have said needs to be there with what's actually in the chain. Right. Right. Because it's how, how specific does that deed need to identify that prior reservation, right. which now may be owned by 40, 60, 80 people who are the descendants of the original people who reserve the interest. Something, unfortunately, that is very confusing is also the reservation language. Grantor reserves to their heirs, assigns, uh, successors, and assigns all mineral rights underneath this parcel. And there's all kinds of ways that that's Mm -hmm. That becomes part of what's called the description in the deed. That is, what's the property that you're talking about? What township, section, you know, et cetera. And then the meets and bounds, which is the survey description. You and I all often run into a series of deeds that then contain the reservation language. And you have to figure out, was it that successor owner's intent to make some kind of reservation, even though it had been previously made, or is it just a typographical error that was included in the description and shouldn't have been? Right. We run into that fairly often, right? Right. Is a is the mention of a reservation new or a repetition of an old one? Okay. And sometimes these are deeds that are, I mean, pretty often we see reservations and deeds, I would say, between, it depends on the county and what activity, I suppose, was happening at the time 100 years ago, but probably between like 1910 and 19... In the 30s sometime, there are all kinds of mentions of reservations that maybe those are the first ones, but you don't know. That's also why sometimes people ask, well, my deed says this, so why do you need to know like the whole chain for 150 years? And it's all of these reasons that we would. Right. Um, because something that happened before could affect what you're, it might not even show up in your deed and it doesn't mean that it wasn't valid or still couldn't be. Um, especially when you have this 40 year window, you have to find out where it is. So you really need the whole big picture to try to narrow down where even to look sometimes. And that just drives up the cost and expense for, right. for the client because you have to assemble that, that chain of deeds. Um, then you got to say, well, you know, these people have, may have an interest. And so if, as often happens, people forgot to transfer those interests between generations under Ohio law. And I think we mentioned this in a prior episode. It, it goes to your heirs upon your death. And uh, so you have to do genealogy and deed analysis. Mm-hmm. And it can get pretty complicated. It, it can pretty quickly. Um, and it all the first step is almost always, maybe always, but I never want to. Is anything like for sure? I don't sure. know. Um the title work is like the first step because you don't even know what's in there until you have that. So that's, that's the key most of the time to even see what's been going on for whatever amount of time on your property. So we have not talked about 
title work. I don't know if we want to do a separate episode on it or not, but what's the big deal? Why does it take so long? Why is it so expensive? In some of the counties in the Golden Crescent, you know, Harrison, Jefferson, Belmont, Monroe, what's the big deal? Why is it so expensive to do the title work? Sure. Um, so when I've talked to title abstractors about this, it's kind of like, like if I call one up and say, I'm looking for someone who needs a search in Monroe County, you're like, oh, Monroe County is notoriously complicated or whatever, because people have made reservations there for a long time um, for coal, partly, and some counties are even worse about coal than others. Like Harrison County has whole volumes of just coal deeds. Mm -hmm. Um, so that varies some and makes a difference because every, every conveyance that's happened on the property would need to be searched. And some of those, the older you get, some deeds are like handwritten. Um, I think some counties have had like fires in their courthouses. And so some records aren't as easy to get as others. Some counties don't have things online. So like all of those things make it complicated. Plus they're building the entire chain when you get title work done. So as far back as they can go sometimes um, with every conveyance, some 200 acre parcel might now be 20 smaller parcels, which can make a difference. So all of those things are kind of like layers of um, ways that it can get complicated when you're needing to do title work. So what are some other issues with applying the Marketable Title Act, a very simple act designed for residential property, the oil and gas issues? Um, I mean, there are all kinds of them, right? Which that's the point of the Marketable Title Act is to make it simpler. And then when it's being applied, there are all of these ways that it can get complicated because every property is different and every chain of title is different. Um, Another complication is the existence of the Dormant Mineral Act, I think, Mm -hmm. which the courts have said there are two options, which I know we'll talk about. So I suppose it could make it more complicated or not um, because they're both options that are out there. So I think another way that the Marketable Title Act can be complicated some is the statutes talk about what a title transaction is. Like if you inherited mineral interest what could have happened with it in the past that saves it from being extinguished. Right. So there are cases about what counts as a title transaction. Um, If you lease it out, is that a title transaction? If you recorded an affidavit saying I'm this person's heir, is that a title transaction? And so all of those details can make a difference too, if an interest is dead or not, basically. So I can, there are certain things that, I know the Dormant Mineral Act calls, which we'll deal with in another episode. And here's the thing. The Dormant Mineral Act is part of the Marketable Title yeah, Act. Okay, it's one So of the it's kind of hard to parse the baby, so to speak, right. legally when you're, when you're looking at, at, this, at this one s- series of statutes. But um, the, uh, the concept from the Dormant mm-hmm. Mineral Act that sometimes bleeds over into the Marketable Title Act is... What have I done with the property? Mm-hmm. What have I done with the mineral interest? Have I leased it? Has it been produced? Have I received royalties? Has it shown up in my ancestors' estates or not? You know, because quite honestly, I would say the majority of families that we deal with with inherited mineral interest, it's like Christmas. Somebody lets you know, hey, right. As a matter of fact, there was an industry early on in the Golden Crescent of people notifying, um, doing the title search, then notifying, oh, you may have a mineral interest. And it's like, wow, it's Christmas. Wow, there's, you know, do I have a right to all these royalties? And that is what then kind of fuels the development of the law because, um, okay, so I think I'm the current owner of a mineral interest. I come to you. You have a title search done. You say, you know, I think you are, but there may be some other claims out there. We think they may have been extinguished. And so I I then am approached by an oil and gas producer to sign a lease. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, sure, great. Here's your lease, but we're not going to pay you Mm -hmm. until you prove that you own the mineral interest. So 
under the Marketable Title Act, how does that work? What happens next? Sure. Um, and so we've had clients in that exact situation, right, where they're offered, usually the they'll call it like a protection lease. And it says, we'll pay you this little amount of money to sign a lease, like 100 bucks or something. Um, and we'll hold everything else, like bonus, royalty, anything, until you you clear your title and show that it's good. With the Marketable Title Act, I think usually when we hear that, um, we're thinking like that's a quiet title action, filing with the court so a judge can say, here's, like basically give an order, here's who owns this, and then the producer can pay. Um, and they'll just kind of sit and wait because once they have their leases, like they've, they've gotten leases, so they can proceed and then hold the payment just like you agreed to in the lease um, and wait for that order to come from a court. So. Right. I think usually that's usually that's the route I think we would see to show. And then in the case we're talking about, like here's what the Marketable Title Act says, here's what your chain of title looks like, why do you own it now instead of maybe someone else who could claim it, like the service owner or someone else in the chain who's not you and your cousins probably. So basically, even though we like to avoid court as much as possible because there's – uncertainty nobody can guarantee what's going to go on in a courtroom basically mineral rights owners are sometimes forced to go to court not to sue somebody for money but in order to get a judge to say who owns what right which is use the word quiet title we also use the word declaratory judgment which actually grew up in the insurance industry you have a claim under your insurance policy um Insurance companies love to say, no, you're not covered. Look at Rider 42 on page 56 of your policy, you know, et cetera. And, uh, and the uh, Ohio law provides that if you have a dispute with somebody over something like that, you can go to court, not to sue them necessarily for money, but in order to get a declaration of who has what rights and responsibilities to the other person. Right. And, and oftentimes our folks are, because they're not getting the money, it's put in, there's a term of art called a suspense account. Can you tell folks what a suspense account is? Sure. Go ahead. I mean, basically it's an escrow account, right? Where mm-hmm. the operator will take that money and keep it in an account sitting there. So they'll, they can still, they're still producing and selling product and just taking that portion of royalty and sitting it in an account until they're ordered for who it needs to be distributed to. Something so it's kind of like they, an escrow account. Right, and something that they often do not even pay interest to the person who right. eventually wins. I say most often. Yeah. That Which means isn't happening. They get to, the, the company, the producer gets to keep the money and the interest that they're generating on that. Right. And um, and so that's, that's why so much of the law that's developed here are out of those situations. The, uh, the producer may have leases from both claimants to the right. mineral interest, right? Right. That's pretty often I think we see that too, especially and if it's a protection lease situation. Right. They probably have them from both. They're just protecting their, their options because either one of these two or maybe three, et cetera, right. may end up owning the mineral interest. And the producer says, we'll keep your money. You go to court, you hire a lawyer, and you duke it out, and then come and tell us who won. Right. Okay? And we'll sit and wait right. and hold the money and which, get the interest. Which for a landowner, I mean, you know, you think, wow, I've got a lease. They wouldn't have given me a lease if I didn't have an interest, but it ain't necessarily so. Right. Sometimes I don't, they might have some, they have some idea of ownership, I think, to approach someone. They have some reason to think you may own it right right but actually like thorough title work i think they usually want the period between signing the lease and paying a bonus payment to do that and a lot of leases will say that that that's their due diligence period is that time and so sometimes they come back and say oh we found this issue and we're not going to even pay the bonus okay maybe on a paid up lease i think sometimes we see that too um so yeah it comes down back to leases being contracts right right and what what does your lease say so um We've talked about some of the disadvantages, and I think people can probably notice the frustration in our voices and our demeanors when we talk about the Marketable Title Act, but the Supreme Court has said you can use it. What are some of the advantages if you're able to use the Marketable Title Act on behalf of a client? 
Um, to protect an interest or, I mean, I think about it as far as, I mean, it just depends on what the chain of title looks like, Mm -hmm. right? So the Marketable Title Act is by operation of law would extinguish interest. Like it would happen before whatever date. And those are all the questions. Like, how do you know when the date is? That Those are the kind of things we've been talking about. Um, so that's how it would generally work. The dormant mineral act is different. You have to be, take action. Right. And we'll talk about that a right. lot. Um, so using it based on an analysis of the Marco title act, I would look at all of those things that we talked about and see like what, where do they fit? Is, or is this chain of title we're talking about for a client consistent with those cases? Like right. is something saved by title transactions or, um, I mean, all the things we talked about, where's the root of title, right? What's the reservation actually say can make a big difference. But if it works, it's the poison pill for any other interest, right? Extinguish. It's, it's been made clear now. Extinguish means gone as if it never existed. It just like in, um, in the Marvel cinematic universe, it's dust. It no, does not sure. exist. We anymore, should use right? that sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll have to tell a judge about that, but we got to make sure that the judge is a Marvel fan first, okay? Sure. Because some of the older folks might say, who, who are they anyway? Um, so it is, it is a powerful tool, but because it is so powerful and because it's not really designed for this kind of analysis, it's very, would the word un- unwieldy sure. be, be good? Mm-hmm. Because... Um, you know, and eventually, as cases work through, we'll get more answers. We'll know more in five years than we know now. We know a lot more now than we did ten years ago before. Mm-hmm. You know, all these, all this case law uh, started to develop. Is there anything else, kind of, on the tail end of this portion about the Marketable Title Act that folks might find interesting? And I, I hope we haven't put anybody to sleep here. Uh, you and I are real estate and in history nerds, you know, we can, we kind of like to get in and figure these things out, but uh, anything else about the marketable title act? I mean, I would just say that it, it really comes down to the chain, you know, like, which I, I was thinking too, like, I wonder if people, if this is helpful or um, boring or not, or what does that, what is somebody hearing this actually think about it? It, it can be so interesting because it can be so complicated, which is not usually what people want to hear when they just want an answer. Right. And I completely understand that. Like, I would love for this, when you're talking about us sounding and looking frustrated, I would love for this to be clear. And I think that's probably true for every, like operators. They want to know, like, can we rely on someone owning something? Correct. Right. Um, and it's, un, it's just not that way. And i it is like a poison pill. And so the, that's this is like the first analysis that we would do when somebody has a question like this. Because it's so powerful. Right. The extinguishment of the old interests is, is a powerful tool if you can wield it, but it is a long sword and it requires a lot of effort to lift it. Mm-hmm. So, um, it does. So uh, the, uh, well, that's kind of our overview of the Marketable Title Act. Something that's very simple that all of a sudden when applied to a f- to facts that it's not designed for can become mm-hmm. very unwieldy as, as we've discussed, but it is still very powerful. We need to pay attention to it. Anything yeah. else, Kate? I, I don't think so. Okay. I'm excited to talk about the Dormant Mineral Act and how it fits in here or does and doesn't and what does it look like? Um, because it's kind of like a second avenue, right? It is. So I'm excited to talk about that too. All right. And uh, please join us for that episode. That's it for the Markable Title Act. Thank you.